So, this is the child who will save the world. Why did you set out on this journey in the first place? It's my mom. I have to save her. Ah! Say cheese! Bring us more! Now leave me alone. Go! Come on, don't go getting all soppy on me. I'm sorry, I couldn't save her. First, you will have to save yourself. <laughs> No, it won't. It's got to be more engaging in the beginning. Nino Cooney on the PlayStation 3. We're going to call this a YTF, okay? I don't want to do this, but... <sighs> Let's get a few things out of the way, okay? I am a massive Ghibli fan. I believe that Hayao Miyazaki is a living treasure. I think he might be our, the gr our greatest living animator. He may even be the greatest animator, the greatest animation director in the history of the art form. I reserve judgment on that. That is the bar I'm setting for him. That is not the bar I set for this game, and it's probably just as well because it would be unfair to compare the work of a great artist like Miyazaki to this PlayStation 3 video game, which near as I can tell is basically sort of, I don't want to say it's baby's first JRPG, but... I'm un I tend to believe this game was created with a mandate to make a very accessible fantasy RPG from Japan. Which is to say, it's not trying to be overly complicated, it's not trying to be lore heavy, it's not trying to be... It's not trying to drown you in systems and present you with a whole lot of... And, a whole lot of weighty choices. This very much appears to be a game that I would have played back in the early 1990s when Final Fantasy 1 and Dragon Warrior came out. On Super NES, it might be more comparable to a game like Final Fantasy Adventure. Not Final Fantasy 2, with the turn with the real-time menu manipulation combat system. But, you know, a more traditional, accessible Japanese RPG without all the bells and whistles you might expect from a game like Resonance of Fate, Valkyrie Profile, complicated RPGs that I tend to play more of these days. But we'll worry about that later. I started here in this... I loaded to the most recent part of my game save, because I've been playing this game for about a couple of hours, I want to say. In fact, let me see if I can get some statistics on that. Uh, let's see, journal. It's not going to be in the journal, is it? Probably not. Story so far. Yeah, I'll go back and review the story later. In fact, I'm, if nothing else, I'm probably going to end up doing a video essay about this game because as a Miyazaki fan and a person who's seen a bunch of Ghibli films, I've seen, all, I've seen nearly all of Miyazaki's films. I, I get the aesthetic, and I've played, obviously, you know, hundreds of JRPGs, so obviously I'm somewhat familiar with the tropes and all of that. So I'll probably end up doing a separate video later where I explain my impression of, you know, the first couple of hours of the game. I'm not impressed with this game. And I'm going to put it out there. I, did, I went in expecting, like, a sort of an okay RPG, but I went, my expectations weren't that high. I expected the story to be interesting. I expected the combat to be sort of forgettable, but not too... I expected it to be basically like Star Ocean. I expected it to be a game with maybe some interesting, you know, action RPG combat. Sort of interesting. With a slightly better story. In a slightly better aesthetic. Well, 
I don't want to say it's a failure on all counts, but I think it's pretty much a failure. <laughs> it's, it's pretty much a disappointment on every count, as far as I'm concerned. But I'm being very... I'm grousing about this, so fair warning in advance. I'm going to be grousing about a lot of things, and I'm not going to be looking at this from the perspective of a casual RPG fan at all. I'm, I've, I've, been, I've seen too much. I can't, I can't see past some... I can't unsee a lot of the stuff I've seen in this game. Okay, enough dilly-dallying. I've been playing for a couple of hours, including the seven minutes I spent rambling during this video already. Spend the night at the cat's cradle while you wait for your new outfit. Okay, yeah, the game made me go to some place to get a new outfit made, which doesn't mean this game's anything like Resonance of Fate, but we'll talk about that later. Yeah, we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about Drippy, who's... Frankly, I think the main reason, one of the main reasons why I don't like this game story. Uh, yeah, you know how he said the word your? Yeah, that's an example of how this game handles the uh, colloquialisms that apparently this character has in the original Japanese language. They try to convert that into something like sort of, I guess sort of old, sort of like countrified uh, British English, I guess you could say. And it's, and his, 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 Dialogue is impossible for me to make sense of in English or or in it, obviously in Japanese. I'm reading the translation. I can't make sense of what this character is supposed to be. He's supposed to be obviously comic relief and all that other nonsense. He gets very old very fast because I was never able to make sense of what kind of what kind of clown he was supposed to be. And eventually, it got to the point where I realized that it's just. There's nothing to him other than just being like a babbling exposition, a babbling exposition dumping clown. And I've never, I can't remember a Miyazaki film that had a character like that. I mean, was Gigi like that in Kiki's Delivery Service? I don't remember that. I wasn't particularly fond of that localization, but that's another issue. I don't understand what they were trying to do with this character, other than make him comic relief and... Just me just not being able to make sense of the kind of comic relief he was supposed to be. Like, like I said, I think he was trying to be countrified. I'm not sure. Maybe his colloquialisms make more sense in the original Japanese. I don't know. I've seen, you know, what, what Neil Gaiman did with uh, Princess Mononoke. I've seen how the, uh, the dialogue was altered in the Ponyo uh, localization in English. Sometimes they can be very literate in these tr localizations, but I... I'm not feeling this story at all. And I can understand some of the decisions they made in terms of the rest of the dialogue. The rest of the dialogue outside of this character seems to be okay. But that particular character is gets very annoying very quickly for me. And a lot of people you know a lot of people you know they're cool with him. You know, people who like I guess people who like, you know, what's that character from Borderlands? Uh not Ratchet. I don't remember the I'm you know the comic relief character from that movie. Comic relief character from that game, yeah. If you like him, I guess you'll like this guy, but he, he drives me nuts. I, I, I can't deal with him. He's too, he's too juvenile for me. For these cutscenes here, you're going to see something interesting. I have a couple of videos I'm going to put up that show just the cutscenes with Japanese dialogue and the English voice acting, and the, and the English translation. I'm listening to this, uh, to these performances in English for this video, but if you want to hear it in Japanese, I have commentary free videos just for that. You're going to get a lot of this. There are going to be a lot of cutscenes like this that show the polygonal 3D uh, adaptation of the Ghibli style. And, you, and then you'll switch to a scene that has a more traditional 2D Ghibli look. So imagine if you were watching Kiki's Delivery Service. And there are scenes out of this game that look right out of Kiki's Delivery Service. They look right out of The Wind Also Rises. They're right out of, you know, Ponyo and Porco Rosso. The imagery... The, the art style, you know, the coloring, you know, the, the character designs, right out of those movies. Right out of those movies. But you get most of the cutscenes in this game look like this. So you're not getting the Ghibli look all the time. You're not even getting it half the time. You're getting the Ghibli look maybe a quarter of the time. And then you're cutting to a cutscene that looks like this, and it doesn't work nearly as well. And to be honest, they were sort of obligated, I guess, to use some of those Ghibli sequences during the game. But again, most of the sequences in this game look like this. So that's the compromise they made. They apparently couldn't afford to have Ghibli do every 
do everything in the game like that. This is, I mean, if you play time, if you've seen my videos of Time and Eternity, that was a game where that had that, that leaned real hard into the anime aesthetic. It kept the anime aesthetic for every part of the game, even when it wasn't, even even when it didn't look that great. I mean, obviously they made compromises in that game because the characters don't move that much, the characters don't talk that much, the characters don't move that much. The entire most of the story takes place during these conversational dialogue sequences where there's no camera movement at all or maybe they'll cut away to a headshot and that's it so obviously there wasn't much animation in time and eternity but it was all with but the entire game was within that anime aesthetic and they didn't do that here and i guess they couldn't afford to do that here and maybe ghibli didn't want to make a video game that was just about you know a bunch of Static cameras and headshots, you know, you know, they, they have a high pretty high standard for their art and I wouldn't be surprised if They decided okay. We'll do full Animation for some cutscenes, but then we're going to use these polygonal models that are based on the Ghibli design for the rest of the game So if if you were going into this game expecting a bunch of you know Ghibli looking cutscenes, you're not going to get them most of them are, most of what you're going to see is going to look like this which is the polygonal adaptation of it Nino Kuni 2 apparently did a better job of coming up with 3D models that look like Ghibli, but again, right now video games using 3D rendering and polygonal models like this are not going to look like Laputa Castle in the Sky. They're not going to look like Castle Cagliostro either. They're not going to look like Nausicaa. They're going to look like this, which is which is to say they're going to look like a video game with a filter on, over it so that it looks kind of like anime. Personally, I think the Naruto games on the 360 look better than this. But Naruto had a few compromises too, because obviously they had cutscenes right from the show, but they also had 3D models based on those cutscenes that look a little better than this, but not much better than this. But again, if you've played the Naruto games on the 360, that's the kind of aesthetic you can expect from most of the storytelling in this game. I'm just talking over these images because I'm not really even reading, reading the story at this point. I've lost interest in the story, to be honest with you. I lost interest in the story about half an hour into the game, and it hasn't really recovered. Oh, so here we go. Here's some more cutscenes right here. You look proper sharp. Yes, he. Yeah, like I said, he's sort of he's sort of English. He's not. I get that. I get that. I understand that. I want to say Xenoblade Chronicles did the same kind of idea where they used UK English for the localization. Not American English. Okay, so pop back in and buy something fun. Okay. So this was just a narrative trigger, basically. So whatever. So we haven't really done anything really interesting in the first 14 minutes. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure we're not going to do anything in the next 20 minutes either. That's all that interesting. I mean, I'm hoping at some point we'll get to see some of the cutscenes. The actual Ghibli animated cutscenes. But if we don't... I'll just go to another game save that I made early and we'll get to see how the game looks with those actual Ghibli animated cutscenes. Not this stuff. Which is okay, but again, it's, this is not the reason why I came to play this game. Sealed by some kind of magic, huh? Well, we're going to see the king. Um... I need to finish watching Laputa, <laughs> because um, I said I've seen most of the Miyazaki's films. I've seen all of his films except for The Wind Also Rises, which is shocking, I know, because it's his last film. You think I would have seen it by now. I have not seen the last half of Laputa. I saw the first half, and I thought it was brilliant. And I need, and to be fair, I have, it's been a while since I've seen Nausicaa, so don't trust my opinion on that yet. Trying to find the king's red herring, huh? Maybe it's in the, maybe it's in the MacGuffin closet or something. Uh, okay, so I guess we can't go here. So if I so I, so I did, so maybe I have to just talk to him first. But yeah, I've seen basically all of his films. But this is not a Miyazaki product. This is, pro this is probably closer to Ursi in terms of his storytelling. Ooh, he went there. Yes, I went there. This is probably no better than Ursi. And that's probably saying something, because it sounds like a Ghibli film. I mean, look, Joe, uh, he, is it Joe Hisaishi did the uh, soundtrack to this game, and it's quite good. It might be great. I haven't heard most. I haven't heard a lot of it. It might be great, but well, he also did the soundtrack to Ursi, and that was some garbage. I mean, the movie sounded great. It looked great. 
in terms of the art, in terms of the art direction, in terms of the still, in terms of the background, the story wasn't that great. <laughs> so, you know. In fact, I, I'm, I'm under the impression that's considered to be the worst Ghibli film in the entire collection. That's probably not saying very much because they've done so many. It's, Ghibli, in a lot of ways, is like Pixar's. But Earth Seal is a legitimately bad movie. Like, don't see it. It's a bad film. I don't think Pixar's ever made a film that bad, and, but I haven't seen The Good Dinosaur, so we'll talk about that another time as well. Uh, so we're going to find a red herring, huh? So I guess you're starting to get the idea. The game actually tells you where to go. If there are side quests, I haven't been interested enough to seek them out. Because ba mainly I've been following the main quest line because nothing else in this game seems to be all that interesting. <laughs> so I've just been sticking to the main quest line because I can't think of anything else I'd really want to do. And once we get to see some combat, you'll start to see why I've been avoiding all that. Because, like I said, this is a traditional RPG. This isn't like Skyrim, where if you don't like the combat, you can kind of, you know, lose yourself in the world and find other mechanics to enjoy yourself with. This game only has two mechanics, really. It's walking around the overworld and talking to these people in towns and getting into fights. And, like I said, that's actually nothing new for RP. It's a very traditional JRPG in that sense. Again, it doesn't give you a whole lot to do. This isn't Dark Cloud. You aren't dungeon crawling, really, in terms of going into randomized dungeons and defeating enemies and collecting crap and using it to craft stuff or unlock new stuff to make the game more interesting. It's Right now, it just feels like a traditional linear JRPG. What is this? Who does this boy look like? Like, what Ghibli, what Ghibli character does he remind you of, actually? Maybe when we see some more Ghibli cutscenes, we'll be able to get a better idea about who he's supposed to be inspired by. I know he looks kind of familiar. Maybe he kind of looks like a male version of what's-her-name from Grave of the Fireflies. I'm not sure. But if you're familiar with the Ghibli house style by now, it's probably you're probably screaming at me. He looks like that guy. I I I I'm drawing a blank. I know he looks familiar. I just don't know what character he's supposed to be similar to. I'm sure someone will remind me. Maybe he looks like a younger version of somebody else. In a way, he kind of looks like you know a, a male sibling from Totoro. I guess you could say one of the Totoro siblings. The, the, red, the younger red-haired pig, red-haired girl with the pigtails. I don't remember her name. Was it my, I don't remember her name. It's been, it's been a decade. It's been two decades since I've seen Totoro. Don't sass me about that. But I remember seeing me, I remember seeing Castle of Cagliostro and my neighbor Totoro back to back, back in 1995. In fact, my, uh, Otaku in Training review is still on Google Groups. If you go to recartsanimation.mi, was it recartsanimation? You can, recartsanime, sorry. You can probably still see my capsule review of that movie. Because I reviewed both films, and I said those, those films are my introduction to Miyazaki. And I, liked, and I liked Totoro well enough, but I thought Castle Cagliostro was brilliant. I said, this is what all the fuss is about. This, this, guy's, this guy's a genius. This guy's Chuck Jones meets Spielberg. He's kind of amazing. And then I saw his other film, and I saw Mononoke, and then I saw... Um, what, was the other, what, what was the film I saw before Mononoke? I'm trying to remember. I didn't see Kiki yet. Remember, th remember, this was before Mononoke came out, so there weren't many Miyazaki films available in the U.S. at the time. Because when, uh, in the mid-1990s, remember, this was when, uh, Techno Man and Sailor Moon and Dragon Ball, the original Dragon Ball, not Dragon Ball, the original Dragon Ball, they had aired in the U.S., and that was a big deal, because there, there weren't many instances in American history where there were a lot of anime shows on the air at one... I know it's hard to believe. There was once a time when there were very few anime shows on TV. And the idea of having three on TV at once was, was mind-blowing. And by the way, when those shows premiered, I want to say there were no anime on TV at the time. Because Dragon Warrior, the series, only ended in 1992, at least in the U.S., only lasted one season. I mean, really, I mean, think about it. 1994, what anime series were on, or uh, were not on cable? Even, even if you include cable. The only anime you probably could watch on cable back in 1994 was what? The Sci-Fi Channel showing Saturday anime movies. Okay. I'm not including Bionic 6. I'm talking about actual Japanese, you know, made shows. G-Force, I believe, was... Yeah, G-Force was still on Cartoon Network, I believe. 
What other anime were on, was on the air at the time? Before, before 1995. Okay, well, when I saw, you know, Castle Caglio... No, My Neighbor Totoro came out in 1995, was distributed by Troma. You know, the Toxic Avengers, the Toxic Avenger Company. I think they did a Swamp Thing movie, too. I mean, they, they were the people who localized My Neighbor Totoro. And, of course, Roger Ebert, you know... Oh, here we go, here we go. Here's the real, you know... Yeah, Roger Ebert really loved Totoro, by the way. Uh, watch Cisco and Ebert if you can. Okay, so now we get to see some Ghibli animations. Some actual... You know, raw, uh, hardcore, Ghibli animation. Mm -hmm. And again, there's not much of it, but you're getting stuff that looks like this. And again, it looks some, it looks like something that's right out of, you know, a tr you know, like a Porco Rosso or a, basically a late 1990s, early 20s. Like basically, this, this does look like a late 1990s Ghibli film. Basically, it looks yeah. I guess you could say it looks something like a cross between Kiki and. You know, the 21st century Ghibli say? films. Because obviously by the time Mononoke came out, Ghibli had developed a new house style that was a lot more ornate, I guess you could say. It was a lot more detailed. Because I mean, you can look at the old Ghibli. Like, you can look at Nausicaa and say, yeah, that's a, that's a very rough, you know, less detailed style. You can look at a film like Kiki and say, yeah, it's definitely an earlier, that's like a 90s Ghibli film, an early, a pre-Mononoke Ghibli film. You mean he broke his like I think, skull? like maybe it's just me. You can always tell the difference between an er, between a 21st century Ghibli film and a 1990s Ghibli film. Although you could argue that *Grave of the Fireflies*, you know, was a lot more detailed than your average 1990s Ghibli film. Yeah, yeah, look, I'm, I'm okay with *Grave of the Fireflies*, but we'll, we'll talk we'll talk about that another time. I'm mainly talking about Miyazaki stuff at this point. You may not have. So yeah, you can tell by the look, yes, this very much looks like a traditional, you know, late 90s, early 21st century, you know, Ghibli film. So they got their money's worth for these little sequences right here, where they clearly commissioned the Ghibli folks to animate a sequence, but then the very next sequence will look like this. It will use the game engine. So they're not using FMV, they're using the game engine for all this. And unfortunately, the, early in the game, like in the first 30 minutes of the game, it becomes very jarring. Because you get scenes like the one you just saw that look, you know, stunning. Because, you know, Ghibli. And then, you, and then the very next scene is going to look like this. And there's going to be no change in tone. The, obviously, the cut scenes are going are gonna, to, you know, be voiced. So the voice acting is still going to be there. You're still going to have to read. But that's the problem. It's that, and th this is always going to be this is always going to be the problem that a lot of video games have until the technology improves, or until the design mandates. Oh, see, the characters aren't talking anymore. <laughs> so until the design mandate changes or the design paradigm changes, video games are going to have this problem. If unless you are willing to commit to doing an entire video game in the 2D, you know, cell animated style. Or in the full motion video style, like a term, like a time and eternity, like a dragon's lair. Until you, or until you commit to that style for the entire game, you're gonna get jarring narrative. You're gonna get jarring narrative juxtap juxtapositions like this. You're going to get sequences that look one way and are paced like a traditional film, and you're gonna get scenes right after it and right before it that look like this, and it doesn't work. Because the story, because the, the way you, when you're watching a story that looks like a movie and doesn't have pauses in between sentences, the pace of the story is going to be completely different than in a scene like this, where you actually have to read a wall of text in order to keep up. And of course, just the visual, just the, just the difference in terms of the storytelling, you know, in terms of the staging, in terms of the pacing, it's going to be completely different if the characters look different, if the art looks different, if the characters stop talking for some reason, as they did here. They just stop talking. So you end, up getting a, you end up getting full motion video for one sequence, followed by an in-game cutscene with spoken voice performance, with spoken, you know, with spoken performances, followed by a scene like this, where the characters don't talk at all, and they're just, you know, and you're just reading through text. 
So you're getting three different kinds of games here at this point. You're getting three different kinds of visual storytelling here. You're getting the tradition. You're getting a full motion video, which is of course the most modern way of doing it. You're getting this, you know, this game engine cutscene with vocal performance style, which is a, which is a, a modern game conceit, obviously, that doesn't use full motion video. And of course, you're getting this wall of text style, which is, you know, as old as JRPGs since the 1980s, I'd say. Basically, it's what every RPG was doing in the 1980s, where you were just reading a wall of text. But of course, this particular style is more common to, like, you know, the 3D era, like Final Fantasy VII and them. Basically, after, Final, after the PS1 era, you can actually have, you know, uh, 3D engines and have characters move around in 3D engines and gesticulate in between sentences, like these characters just did. Yeah, that's when the PS1 era introduce that style well obviously some computer games probably use a similar style but as far as console games are concerned jrpgs basically just started that i don't know if final fantasy 1 started it but yeah i don't sorry i don't want to say that final fantasy 7 started it but yeah this whole 3d idea of having a 3d models having characters walk around a 3d space and gesticulate wordlessly voicelessly while in between, you know, walls of text, yeah, that's Final Fantasy VII, I want to say. And of course, that became the standard way of telling a story in video games for, at least in RPGs, for darn near three decades, and they're still doing it. And every once in a while, you get a game like Time and Eternity that tries to mix it up by doing full motion video all the way through, and I need a map. Uh, select. R1. There we go. So I had to go down into the east, so south into the east. Follow the star on the mini-map up there on the right-hand side of the screen on top. I've been rambling about the story more often than I do in most video game videos that I do because this is one of the games where the story matters most to me. I, most RPGs, I try to avoid the story if I can, but this is a Ghibli video game. I have to talk about the story because I... I mean, I, li I love Ghibli movies, and unfortunately... One of the reasons why, one of the reasons why, stop, I mean, I can obviously I always when I always watch when I'm not playing video games I watch movies, but one of the reasons why I don't like cutscenes in video games is because unfortunately as I'm playing this game it reemphasizes my point. Video game storytelling right now, in this style, this kind of video game storytelling is not as effective as traditional Ghibli storytelling. Ghibli is one of those uh, studios that's perfected, I would argue, this particular kind of, you know, cinematic storytelling. And you can't translate that storytelling to a JRPG because the storytelling rules are different. There's, there's too many walls of text in, in JRPGs. There's too much combat in JRPGs. There's too much... You know, there's just too much, there's too much menu manipulation, too much, you know, filler in JRPGs. So the cinematic storytelling conceits of a Ghibli film just don't work in video games because the rules, the rules are just different. This is a 50, 60 hour video game, probably. You can't tell a Ghibli story in 60 hours. There's too much filler. The pacing, the, the pacing of a Miyazaki film doesn't work in a video game like this. Just, just the rules are different. This is why a game like, you know, Grand Theft Auto V can't be compared to The Godfather because the rules of the storytelling are different. The visual storytelling, the visual story, the visual grammar is completely different. So, I mean, you, you can't do that. You can, make an Ill, you can make illustrated radio, you know, you can do like, you know, machinima if you want. But you can't do traditional cinematic storytelling in a game that's about walls of text. It's not, it's, not the way, it's, not the, it's not the way visual storytelling works. I'm not going to be that guy who says video games shouldn't tell sophisticated stories. But what I'm telling, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm stating and declaring is that you can't tell cinematic stories like this with all of this. You need, you need more visual. You need more cinematic storytelling um, tools. You need more visual storytelling conceits. This reading 
Yes. <laughs> and menu manipulation and walking around in between, you know, waypoints. You can't do that. That's not how you tell a movie story. So, I mean, if you've been playing video games for three or four decades like I have, you just realize this. You can't, you can't tell, you can't tell a movie, you can't tell a cinematic story like this. So just accept the fact that you're playing a video game with geeky looking cutscenes. And you'll be better off. So yeah, if, if people are gonna compare Cast Spells Oliver has learned, okay, how about this? This is free. That's free. So this is why I tell people, yes, yeah, just like a Ghibli. No, it's not like a Ghibli movie. It's like a video game based on a Ghibli movie with Ghibli cutscenes inserted, sort of sprinkled throughout the story. So in that sense, it's like playing um a Star Wars video game back in the Sega CD era, where there were cutscenes from the movie interspersed between traditional gameplay. It's like Final Fantasy VII in that sense, where you're playing a traditional Square RPG, you're playing a traditional Japanese RPG with some full motion video thrown in there every now and then. But it's not like watching a movie. It's like playing a video game with cutscenes. Restore King Tom's missing enthusiasm. I mean, how thrilling does this sound, by the way? Everything that I'm doing right here is basically going to take me about maybe an hour. Maybe half an hour if I wasn't, you know, blabbing on as much as I was. Now, like I said, traditional JRPG stuff. Like, you see a treasure chest like that, you see a vase, and you steal from it. You know, you know, it's, you know, it's stuff I've been doing for 30 years, you know, whatever. I mean, is, what does this game learn from 30 years of JRPG development? Like, what lessons has it learned? I'm not sure. Because I, as I've been playing this game for two and a half hours, my impression is that it doesn't want to change any of these tropes. It just wants to make these tropes more accessible. So that, you know, if an eight-year-old or a nine-year-old Ghibli fan wants to play an RPG, well, this is supposed to be pretty inviting. I mean, it's obviously not trying to be Majora's Mask or Resonance of Fate or, you know, Tactics Ogre. It's not trying to be, you know, overwhelming and give you, like, and drown you in, like, all kinds of... and drown you in all kinds of information. It's not about information overload where you're trying to figure out what's needed and what's not. This is an XCOM, which isn't a JRPG, obviously. Okay, uh, give heart. Oh, that's what I'm doing. Okay, I wasn't even paying attention. I got the distilled spirit of get up and go. So I stole that from somebody in town and I'm giving it to the king. It's a mechanic. And the mechanic is cast this spell with this character to fill up, so to fill up some consumable and then cast a spell on another character that consumes that item, I guess. Which, again, is this going to add up to anything? I don't know. I mean, maybe it's going to be more interesting later. And like I said, I, I complained about this earlier. Compare these models to the models in the cutscene. It just doesn't work. In fact, the, in fact the, 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 the massive difference in the art styles is just so jarring that I almost, almost sort of feel like... I almost sort of feel like I wish Ghibli didn't animate the cutscenes. Because they just seem they just seem massively out of place. Like I said, it, it contributes to how it contributes to the nature of the to how fragmented the storytelling seems to be. It feels like three different games are being sort of smushed together because again the budget doesn't allow them to make a fully animated Ghibli RPG. But they have to be able to promise people one of the one of the promises one of the one of the deliverables associated with this game is that. Yes, Ghibli did an RPG, and here's how it looks. But yeah, but, you know, I've seen maybe six minutes, five or six minutes of Ghibli animated cutscenes so far in the first two hours of this game. I mean, they, I mean they're not lying. There is, Ghibli, there is Ghibli, you know, animation in this game. But you have to know, and I'm sure most people who bought this game were probably somewhat aware going in that it was going to mix traditional 3D JRPG aesthetics with Ghibli cutscenes. But were they expecting this few, I guess? I'm curious. In fact, I'm going to ask... There are a couple of uh, discussion groups I'm going to go to. I'm going to ask them, okay, before this game came out, before you played this game, 
How much Ghibli animation were you expecting out of this game before you played it? And were you satisfied with the amount of animation you actually got in the story? Or were you, did you like the story anyway, despite how little Ghibli animation? Because, I mean, you know, there's a lot of people, you know, they're, they're, they're a lot more, sat, they're a lot more, you know, satisfied by this game than I was. They're like, you know what? I thought it was a good story. I thought it was a fun, light, accessible story. And there's great Ghibli animation on top of it. So it's like a bonus to them. It's like a cherry on top of the game that they think is actually pretty good. Now, personally, I happen to think those, um, those Ghibli cutscenes are like, they're like the chocolate, they're like the chocolate chip cookie dough in a really bad pint of ice cream. Like, let's say you got like a really crappy store brand, like organic, <laughs> organic non-dairy ice, non-dairy ice dessert, frozen dessert, and there's cookie dough in it, and the cookie dough tastes good, but everything else tastes, everything else is kind of meh. It's like, it's like fluff it's like it's like frozen it's like frozen peeps <laughs> frozen marshmallow peeps with cookie dough in it and i would argue that's not a very good ice cream it's like that it's like that ice cream that's made out of rocket fuel and um it's like that, it's like that ice cream that's made out of frozen milk and rocket fuel with some guar gum thrown in there or some kind of thickener it's not much of an ice cream but it's got cookie dough in it, so you probably think you got a good deal out of it, because cookie dough is always good, right? Well, they got Ghibli animated cutscenes in this video game. I'm, I'm going back and forth. I'm, I'm doing the back and forth relay race in this part of the town, aren't I? We'll get to cut. We'll get to a uh, like combat later. Don't worry. It'll be a one-hour video. We'll do some combat later. Trust me. The con you won't have you won't have to see very much of the combat. It gets very old very quickly. The Carter Master. Mm-hmm. Well, walked right into that one. Which reminds me, the Ravens are playing the Redskins today. Sorry, the Ravens are playing the uh, Washington, D.C. football team. Uh, three types of weapons, armor, and accessories. Remember that? Uh, I was really on it. A cauding. <laughs> a cauding. I, I just can't. This stuff is... This, some of this stuff is just, you know... Again, I don't want to be that grump, but you know what? Like I said, all the colloquialisms just don't seem to work. And, it, and it's not charming. It just feels like... It feels like... It feels like a four kids animated series from the early... In the early 2000s, where it's just a lot of, a lot of bad, um, like a lot of really bad, like, <laughs> just a lot of really bad wannabe charming dialogue bits like that. It's kind of, it's not grating, but it's just kind of disappointing. It's eye rolling. There was always a lot of eye rolling stuff in those old four kids translations because they wanted to be clever, and it was like, you know, it's, no. You aren't Dr. Seuss. Just Carter Master. <laughs> Again, that that I I want to say that's fun, but it's just... in a Ghibli film, in a Miyazaki film, I don't think you would see much of that. It's like it's like call, it's like going up to a Neko. There's a Neko down there. It's like going up to a Neko and calling her a Neanderthal, and calling that a really funny joke. And I'm sure it's hilarious to some people, but. <laughs> I just can't. I, I, I've seen enough for. I've seen enough. I've seen enough good anime to not put up with bad anime, and that's kind of how I feel about this game. It's just. It's not even. It's it's, it's just mediocre anime. It just happens to have Ghibli animated cutscenes, which is basically what I how I felt about Earth Sea. It's basically what a. It's basically what a Ghibli film would be, if. Uh, was it Yoshi? What was it? What was the, who was the director of Arietti? I forgot his name. Basically, if Miyazaki retired and that Arietti dude wasn't around, I was worried that every, every Ghibli film would just wind up looking and sounding like Ursi. Which is great if you really... There, look, there are, there are some film critics 
who actually gave what I thought were some of the laziest prey, the laziest three star reviews of e three stars out of four, the laziest B minus reviews I've ever seen for a Ghibli film. It's almost like I'm a critic. I admire Miyazaki. I admire Ghibli's look. And look, if you saw Earthsea and you and you weren't really like familiar with the subtleties of a great Miyazaki film, if, to you like if you're the kind of person who thinks that all DreamWorks and Pixar films look the same, then yeah, you could reasonably you can look at a film like Earthsea and say yeah, it looks like a Miyazaki film. It sounds like a Miyazaki film because of the soundtrack. You could read a Hayao Miyazaki film. So maybe, uh, you know, a casual fan could walk into Earthsea and say, you know what, that was, you know what, I liked it, it was pretty, it, it was pretty, it, was, it, had, it had so many pretty pictures, the soundtrack was great, the characters looked like Yayao Miyazaki characters, it had, you know, it, it was fantasy, it was, you know, it was magic, it was, you know, Victorian, medieval, you know, architecture, you know, steampunk, was there any steampunk, I don't remember. I, I haven't seen the last. I haven't seen the the last half of Earthsea. I gave up on that in about an hour. Earthsea is terrible. <laughs> See, look at this. And when someone in our world, O E O U R E R world, is in a potch, you can sometimes find out how to help them in their, from their soulmate over in your world. Y O U E R world. I don't under again. I don't understand it. And he keeps doing the your and our stuff, and I don't know what that's about. Like I said, all the other British colloquialisms are, you know, I guess, I can see what they're trying to do. It's just, you know, it's just... Like I said, he's basically, he's basically just a lore dump. If you listen to his English voice actor, you kind of see... Flippin' heck, mon! <laughs> yes, if you listen to his English voice acting, he's kind of, you can tell he's, he's kind of straining to do a particular kind of British dialect, and I'm not sure what it is. He's not a Londoner, obviously. I just don't know what kind. I just don't know what part of England he's supposed to be from. I think it's supposed to be something from the English countryside, but I don't know which part of the English countryside. I mean, because I mean, I, I've read enough George Bernard Shaw to know that there are so many different accents in England that you can't just, unless you're from the area and you're familiar with all the peculiarities of it, you probably won't be able to pick it out unless you know them all. Like if you're like like if you're an American, you know the difference between like you know the the Minnesotans and the Alaskans and the Californian Valley types and the and the and the Huns over in you know all the Huns in Maryland where I live. <laughs> like if you know all the different dialects, if you know the difference between y'all and from the y'alls out in Texas and the dirty South Atlanta dialects and you know the up north New York accents, then yeah, you might be able to figure it out. But I don't know enough about England to know what part of England they're trying to they're trying to go for. Where am I supposed to be going? Now I've lost look for Tommy the Cat in Motor. Have to go to Motorville now. So in the final twenty minutes of this video we'll be able to do some uh, combat it looks like. Yeah I got about twenty minutes on this D V D unless I get cut off at some point. So my job is to leave. And I'll save my game once I get to the outside. See, there's your Nekos, like I said. Some for everyone in this game. Uh, well, not really. It's, it's all PG rated. So again, for people who think that anime uh, is all about, you know, tentacles and... Uh, tentacles and lollies. Well, uh, this is the Gee... This is, this is the family-friendly uh, Japanese animation. So this is, this is the kind of anime that makes you say, you know what? It's... Japanese anime isn't all, you know, irredeemably juvenile. <laughs> but it's not exactly, you know. I don't need to stay the night. I just want to save my game. So I'm not going to do that here. Wait, do I need to spend the night here? I mean, yeah, I think that star is just part of the logo. I don't need to actually... That's not a, that's not a point of... Yeah, that's, yeah, that's not a point of entry. That's just, that's, yeah, that's not a, a map icon. So I have to actually leave this thing. I thought I'd be able to get to the, I have to leave the town to get to the world map, so I understand. I can't go down here yet, so... One day I'll be able to expose this fast travel mechanic. I'm assuming that's what that is. I have no idea. I'm leaving. Finally. That town was boring. So I spent 45 minutes blabbing and doing fetch quests. 
How thrilling was that? I'm sure, I'm sure some people, you know, they're into that. They accept it. They have a high degree of tolerance. I don't, I have, a, obviously, I've been, I've been put, I put 200 hours into Skyrim. So I have some degree of tolerance for walking and fetching stuff. So obviously some, some of that doesn't bother me. But in Skyrim, there's a lot more to it than just that. You know, there's, there's like a dozen other mechanics that are somewhat interesting to explore. This game doesn't have any of that. Okay, so the game saved. Okay, so now we get to see the overworld. Music in the Silver War is actually very good, so I'll definitely splice it into this video. I'm going to Motorville. Uh, I don't know where Motorville is. That makes things slightly more interesting. It's not down there. Um, where do they want me to go exactly? Now I feel like a doofus. Uh, let me go to my journal. Oh, I haven't found my, I haven't found that woman's three sons. I'll find them eventually, because I'm, I gotta, well, maybe if I don't sell the game first. Okay, thank the king, so uh, Oliver heads back to Motorville. Heads back! So how do I get back home? That's the part I haven't figured out yet. Okay, well, we'll do that, because Motorville's supposed to be my home. I don't even remember the name of my hometown. That's how little I pay attention to the story. It's, Lost interest at some point. Okay, so I saved the game. So I'm going to wander around this overworld and avoid... There, is no, there are no blind random encounters in this game. Those enemies, you see, those animals you see wandering around, if you touch them, they will fight you. If you get close to them, they will charge you. There's something up here. Again, this overworld does look very good. Okay, I don't know what I found. Proper naked I am. Yeah. Oh, wait, okay, that guy saw me, so I'm going to run away. I don't know where I'm going. Uh, let me see if I can figure out where I need to go here. I'm just going in some direction. I don't even know where it's supposed to. Whoops. Okay, I'll fight this dude. Fine. So you get to see some combat. Okay. Keep things simple. We'll start with me, and then we'll show you my, um, my companion. So we'll start with me fighting. Real-time combat. Run around, press the X button, and you and then you just attack somebody. You'll see a clock over there on the bottom left hand corner on the left hand corner of the screen. I'm not gonna worry about that just yet. Gonna attack. So it's real time ish. You can also press the circle button while I'm in the middle of attacking to cancel that attack animation sequence. Which you might have to do if you're facing an enemy that's slightly stronger than you might have expected and you wanna run away a bit some more. As you're going to find out, most of the combat in this game is basically you running around like an idiot like I was just doing, and then occasionally attacking an enemy if you think, if you think they're vulnerable. Which I do not find particularly engaging. In fact, I think it's a very, very lame version of Star Ocean's combat. Which wasn't even that great in the first place. The first two Star Ocean combat, the first two Star Ocean gets a very mediocre combat because there's really nothing to it. It's very... There are no tactical considerations to be made whatsoever. Or there are very few tactical considerations to be made. And ultimately, it's kind of fruitless because you can just turn it into a turn-based action game by basically ending the, by basically ending the real-time component and just playing like a turn-based action game. I haven't played Star Ocean 2 that way, but I remember that being an option. You can play in full real-time, semi-real-time, or in turn-based mode. And I think that kind of takes away from some of the appeal of the combat. It's supposed to, like I said, it's supposed to be like a real-timey uh, game where you run around and occasionally whack people with your sword or whatever. So I'm, I guess I'm getting items. But again, I don't know where I'm heading. I don't know how to, I don't know how to go back to Motorville. Is Motorville up there? I can't zoom in, can I? I can't zoom in like that. But now I feel like an idiot, because I don't remember where Motorville is. Oh yeah, I think it's supposed to be up there. See that, yeah, that little, right above my little up arrow right there, the little north arrow at the top of the screen? That little green cave, I think it's supposed to take me back. So let's make the circuit. We're going to go around. Okay, these guys saw me. Let's see if I can run away from them. Otherwise, I'll have to do more combat. Once they see you, they're pretty fast. 
But it's good that you... That's one thing this game has learned from the older JRPGs, is that, yeah, blind encounters suck. And people like being able to avoid enemies if they can. In mo obviously, in most old RPGs, encounters couldn't be avoided. Okay, so I'm going to take on this guy. If you, if you can sneak up on these guys and initiate an attack... Uh, and you can get, and if you do that, you get a preemptive attack, which means you get to attack first. But, you know, again, in this game, it's not particularly meaningful unless the enemies are really strong. That's unfortunate. So, again, on the bottom left hand corner of the screen, watch that blue clock that appears once I attack. Like that. So, that blue clock appears. And I can press circle to cancel out and just run away. Th those are all the options that are available to me now. I have some magic spells, but I don't need any of them against these guys. In some of the harder areas, I will, but again, early in the game, there's not a lot of strategy in this game. So I'll do one more combat sequence with this character, and then you'll get to see my companion right there who just leveled up, level 6. He levels up anyway, even if I don't use him. Smitey. So you'll get to see uh, Smitey Mouse or whatever. And then uh, after I do one more combat sequence as this main character whose name I've completely forgotten because he's so forgettable. There's a bird over there. I need to go left. Let me turn around because I don't want to get snuck up on. We can do this. Okay, so one more combat sequence with this guy, and then we'll go to the then we'll go to Smitey. Uh oh. He tried to hit me with a sleep spell, so that means he's more. That means he's a bigger threat. It looks like. So I guess my logic should be go after the most threatening enemy, and it's almost always the person who can attack you from a distance. But as you can see, there's not a whole lot to the combat here. I mean, like, you know, whatever. I mean, Secret of Mana probably has... Secret of Mana has more bells and whistles so far, because it actually had, a, actually had weapon farming. You, you know, if you used a weapon, you actually gain experience by using that particular weapon. So, that, so, if, you get, so if you used a weapon, you became more proficient using that particular weapon. There weren't a lot of good, you know, mechanics in Secret of Mana, but that was one of the decent ones, I guess. Because the rest of the combat sucked. I've already done a bunch of videos on that, but it, I reached a dead end, and I ultimately got to the point where I said I just didn't want to bother anymore. Okay, let's switch to Smitey. Smitey, I choose you. So we're going to press the attack button. He's a bit stronger than um, our hero, our traditional hero. But he's smaller, so he takes more damage, I want to say. So keep that in mind. You can heal him if you have to by basically switching out, by basically uh, switching places with him in combat. Um, but this is pretty much all the risk of the combat at this point of the game. Like I said, I'll cast a few spells if I need to, but right now this is pretty much all the risk of the combat and I don't like it. Again, if, if you want to if you want to do a little video electronic abnegation, you know what? It's fine. It rewards you for doing very little, you know, it's I guess I guess it's like uh, I can't think of it. There are a lot. I think it's like a it's like a Lego game in that sense. It constantly rewards you for doing very little. Not him. Okay, press left or right on the D-pad to switch enemies. I'm gonna attack the bartender. Whoops, wrong guy. I should have I should have attacked him because he, he's the magic user. Minor bird. B Y R D bird. I think it was B Y R D E. Sorry. So yeah, there's, there's literally been two and a half hours of this. This one hour video is going to show what I've been doing for the last three hours. This. So you got to see one of the Ghibli cutscenes, and before the video ends, I'll show you another one. Because there are much better looking cutscenes earlier in the game, but like I said, this game is just... Uh, whatever. I can't go in here, can I? Nope. Is he going to tell me where to go? Why he? Way he? I have no idea what he just said. <laughs> Again, he's supposed to be funny and charming. I don't. I... Like I say he's not grating. He's just you know he gets old quick, and there's not much to him. Can I go up and around? I'm gonna have to go up and around. We'll bring out Smitey one more time. Rhinosaur. Come on. Basically, po yeah, we're basically this is a Pokemon game. <laughs> Anyway, so Oliver is my name. Yeah, Oliver is my name. Smitey is my companion. Okay, he's dead. That, guy gonna, that guy's gonna attack me with a spell, is he? 
You can pick up these little blue things along the way to reheal you and rebuild your magic, I want to say, but... Like I said, if you kill an enemy, you can't. You have to pick it up before the battle, before the this this screen shows up, before this congratulations screen shows up. So that's somewhat annoying, but you have to keep that in mind. You have to pick these up. You have to pick up those things before the battle ends. So maybe you might have to adjust your tactics to do so. But again, this game isn't really that hard. It's just it's just really just sort of a bunch of this. They were fine. I'm not taking that much damage. I mean, I've gone up a few levels, but the strategy wasn't much different than this when I was weaker. Just run around and pick the enemy you want to attack first, and then, you need to, then when you get close enough to it, just wait till the attack sequence ends and occasionally press circle if you think you're going to die. But even then, you're just running around. Running around, occasionally attacking. Not really making a lot of important tactical decisions along the way. I just This is not the way back to Motorville. Okay, so this is, the, this is the first dungeon I went to in this game. This... Restores your HP and MP. We're not gonna worry about this. I'm just gonna go in here, fight a few enemies, and leave. See, there's not a whole lot to this game, and I'm disappointed in that. In fact, do I even want to go back to Motorville? Because the game's not even telling me how to get back to Motorville. I mean, this is just a right another dungeon. How do I get back to Motorville? I don't even know anymore. I probably just I probably went the wrong way in the first place. So I'll leave here and save my game in case assuming for some reason I want to come back and I probably don't. So I'll create another game save right here. In fact, we'll save it right here, whatever. So I'll go back to my game save at the beginning of Ding Dong Dell a bit later, because I, I think I went in the wrong direction. <laughs> yeah, I think I went in the wrong direction, because that was, that was the last dungeon I went to. So how did I get here? I, I don't remember anymore. Now I feel like a doofus. So I guess that's a challenge. I, mean, I need to go south, right there. You see that right there, where my little arrow is on the bottom of the screen? Maybe that's some of that little red area is where I need to go. I don't know. But let me load my game save. So I'm going to go back to the... Yeah, I've already saved my progress, don't worry. So I'll go back to the beginning of the game, and you'll get to see a little bit of the cutscenes that take place with the, um, with the mother and all that. Because like I said, a lot, there are parts of this game that are straight out, of, straight out of Kiki's Delivery Service. You would not be shocked at all if you saw this sequence, and you might have con got, got confused with another Ghibli film, because that's how uh, familiar the aesthetic is. So I want to say, hopefully I'll be able to do this for the end of the video. Sneak it out, yeah. This is the first, uh, this is the first save point. So yeah, obviously I'm not going to bother playing any more of this game. It's way more expensive than it needs to be at GameStop, but I was able to get it uh, with a bunch of, with some store credit at another retro store that was willing to sell me the complete version for 13, 14 bucks. Which is, which is about what it's worth on the secondary market right now. GameStop will give you 10 bucks store credit for it at least. So I definitely made out like a bandit in that sense because this game is not available in my library. Which would have been, I mean, maybe they used to have it and they already sold all their copies because they're, they're too beat up, I suppose. You can't, you can't move that camera around, by the way, just so you know. Okay, now this is a, yeah, here we go. Here's a traditional Ghibli cutscene. You get to see more Ghibli. More full motion video. Hey. In here. See? What are you looking at? That guy, that, that, that bespectacled dude right there looks like he's right out of Kiki, doesn't he? He looks like, he looks like, he looks like Kiki's friend, well, doesn't he? I don't remember his name. Was it, it wasn't. wouldn't go to bed. So, is it finished? Sure is. The last bearing's in, and she's primed for action. Wanna see? So you can tell they kept some of these character uh All right. these character designers around. They know this style by now. Here goes see that see that little okay. turn he did, that little turn he did before he crouched. That's oh, great this animation this there. So, so it was, like I said, you know, it's not it's not Disney, you know, it's not Disney level full motion stuff. <laughs> like twenty four frames a second all the time. Us, but they have these awesome little touches in these films that are always that are always so, like exciting even though you know they're not, you know, Disney yeah. level. <laughs> but again, a good animator knows when to add those little touches. 
Like in, you know, Spirited Away. Like when, um... Like when, um... Sorry, Chihiro, you know, a little... She puts on her shoes and she taps them on... She taps the front of her shoes when she puts them on. Like any kid would do. Like animators add that stuff and it's brilliant. Yeah, I, I, in, fact, one of my, in fact, one of my favorite, like, bits in any Miyazaki film is from Castle in the Sky when... They hear when the when the male protagonist sees the you know the female floated the princess floating down from the sky, he just instinct and he's been fishing and he instinctively just reaches out his arms to catch her and he's, he's like whoops let me put down my bucket because I've been carrying this bucket the whole time let me put down this bucket so I can grab her. Those little touches like that, like in Nausicaa, there's a sequence where uh, you know one of the uh, one of, where a character is pointing a gun at Nausicaa. And she says, "Look behind you." And, and any, and, you know, it's a trope in any movie. But and the and the and the gun-toting character looks behind her and then and then shoots a side eye right back at soccer, right back at Nausicaa before she turns around. So she does turn around, but she gives her, but she gives her the side eye just for a little brief moment because she knows she's like, it's that little bit where it's like, "No, you're lying to me. You're trying, you're trying to do that trick. You're trying to do that bit. We want me to, we want me to look behind. You're gonna attack me." No. But it's that, it, like the film, the animators were smart. Miyazaki is smart. He knows that in that in a real in a real situation in this cartoon, this fantasy world, that if a person were pointing a gun at someone and the and the target says, "Look behind you," the gun toter is not going to be dumb enough to just turn around and not look back at her target. She's gonna she's gonna peek back before committing to turning her head around. Lying? Stuff Holly, like that. What's taking you so long? I'm sorry. Miyazaki's a genius and all those animators, they they get it. Who was it? They know the kind of stuff that you gotta put into an animated film to make it really sell the story. And it's not like it's not like the frivolous stuff you'll see in some in some anime. Like you'll see a lot of smoke effects and flame effects and hair animation and it doesn't enhance the story and look i get i love that stuff too i th i still think that uh that pr that uh yasunori umetsu short film i think his name is uh, he did a short film on um robot carnival called uh what was it i'm gonna skip this it was called uh presence and it was basically just a bunch of hair effects and you know uh, wind-blown clothing effects, and I thought it was just captivating. But I don't, I don't really want to say it enhanced the story, but it created a lot of visual interest in a story that's ultimately just a bunch of talking heads. But again, these guys at Ghibli understand that. Yeah, yeah, that's the villainous. She basically just sits there cross-legged and just makes random comments. And I do think it's a nice touch that the inside of her cape is basically the cosmos. <laughs> I've seen that in other animated series and like in other, you know, con I just don't remember what animated series I've seen it in. Yeah, that's his, that's his dead mother. We'll see her later. Okay, yeah, we're going to skip this part because I want you to see the next cutscene. Yeah, this is it right here. This is it. So we'll get to finish off the video with this cutscene. Yeah, we got two more minutes. Okay, so you get to see, the, you get to see this whole cutscene. So look at this, you're gonna see this. This is this is like the flight sequence in Kiki, isn't it? It's like only instead of, you know, trying to do that, you know, flying machine, he's on a he's on a car instead. And of course, like I said, like the way like the way like all like look at all the rattling animation they got here, all the rattling effects they do here. Again, just brilliant little details like that. And stuff like this, right here, like that like stuff right there. It doesn't just go, it just kind of sputters a bit, like that kind of stuff. Yeah, and that's like right out of Princess Mononoke, that little bit right there. <laughs> With the uh, scrolling uh, background. There's no CG though, it's just, I want to say it's, I don't say it's just all hand-drawn. No CG, uh, no CG, um, no CG car there. And that, and that water effect looks like looks like something right out of Batman the Animated Series. In fact, it looks like looks like a water effect right out of Superman the Animated Series. And that water animation right here—that's that's right out of Ponyo. Stuff like that. Great animation, like I said. So, but again, it's all limited to these cutscenes here. And then, and then, see, watch what happens here. Watch how the scene ends right here. It's, 
really jarring. Spoiler alert. See, that's the end of the sequence. That's it. And then they cut it like, what was that about? Oliver? And the music just cuts Where out too. It's weird. And it's kind of annoying. Like, oh. Miyazaki would never allow that, would he? Oh, sweetie, He'd never I'm allow that. Okay. Uh, although, uh, although I do like when Ghibli characters embrace each other. I That's always nice. I'd known, I'd never <laughs> they, they really do commit to the hugging in these Ghibli films sometimes. That hunk of junk, I can make another one in no time. Well, I, think I mean, the, uh, what was it? In Spirited Away, there's that whole bit where uh, Chihiro is yeah. hugging the dragon god, and she's like, she's like shoving a, she's shoving an expectorant. I want to say, in his, in, down his throat, and she's holding him down while he's thrashing about, like, that kind of stuff. I mean, they, they, they don't, they don't play when they animate. They, they are really, they really lean into these emotions, and the sincerity is always great to see in a good Ghibli film. And then this scene ends, and then watch what happens in the next scene. As we run out of time. See, we're back to this. So after that, you know, after that, se that incredibly emotional sequence, we're back to this, this, this meh 3D game engine aesthetic. After watching all that beautiful animation, we got to go back and watch it.